Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of Songs That Define a Guitarist alongside my co-captain is always on this special show we do once a month, Mr. Phil Aston from Now Spinning Magazine. What's up, Phil? How you doing? All right. Thank you. Great to be here again, Pete. Yeah, um, good to see you. It's going to be a challenge, this one, I think. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> it would, Phil and I were just chatting before we started recording here, and uh, the list, this is Phil's list. He put this particular one together this month. We we alternate every other month, and when Phil sent over this list of guitarists, I was like, wow, that's a great, great list of some great players. I said, this should be fairly easy, and then when we actually sat down to do it, turned out it was not so easy, so yeah uh some great players lots of great songs that kind of define them and just picking one is kind of difficult as always i mean none of these are really easy right phil i mean i i've had i think there have been some that have been like yeah i was instantly thinking of this particular song but for most of these guys not the case not the case no not at all not at all um shall we shall we start with um the order of which i sent them through yeah absolutely yep mm-hmm Okay, then. The first one on the list, everybody, is Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top. Now, when we're, as if this is show number three in this series, and when I first started, when I first thought of the idea, it was songs or that define a guitarist from my own personal perspective. And then as I've gone along, I've thought, is this the song I would choose for people who'd never heard of this person before? And it's kind of, it's, it, and that, that's probably what's made me change uh, and flip the coin on some of the songs I would have picked. And ZZ Top is one of those that I thought would be really easy, but it isn't. And I'll be honest that um, I thought of some of the classic stuff. And then I was thinking, what song do I, did I really like the most? And it was actually from Eliminator. So not you were class as the 70s classic period. But to me, this is when in the UK, ZZ Top exploded because of those three videos, etc., And it was going to be, I need you tonight because it's a slow blues and the way he plays it, the restrain and the little bit of echo on it. But I decided, no, it has to be something that also shows off his bluesy boogie and the side to him. And I thought it has to be, might sound obvious, but it's, you know, but it's give me all you loving track one side one. Yeah. I, I mean, you bring up a good point about, picking a song that you would present to someone who really doesn't know this these guitar players at all and that's that's one of the things that i struggle with when i do these is that do i go that route or do i pick a song that i really really like a lot or do i really try to dig so deep that i'm like all right well in this particular song it has everything that i know and love about this guy all in one track right so there's many ways to go with this and i think that both of us tend to pick one of the three reasons for picking these particular songs and you can you can change from from track to track and i yeah i would agree that that song is probably a great pick for someone to say okay you don't know billy gibbons here he is this is what yeah. this is all about right yeah um so i for this particular pick i really struggle with billy gibbons a lot because there are so many seemingly obvious choices so i went with something that wasn't so obvious i went with a song that i really like a lot and it's going way back and i think it's a song where he throws at the listener all sorts of cool little things that he does so well i went with brown sugar from the first album uh, uh right. the reason why i picked it is because at the beginning He's doing this little unaccompanied bluesy shuffle thing, right? So he's showing his old school blues playing. It's a little funky. It's, you know, swampy. And then all of a sudden, the big Billy Gibbons riffs that we know and love so well. And then the guitar solo is just like amazing. So I, I picked this one, maybe for me, a little obvious, but because I love the song so much, but because he takes you through this whole kind of tour of all of the little tricks in his bag throughout the whole song. And he does it, you know, on the second song of the first album they release, right? So it's so early on, but I totally applaud your pick too. I almost went with like, you know, beer drinkers and hell raiders and waiting for the bus. I mean, there's, there's all these other yeah. ones that I could have picked. And I was like, Ugh. so I, I went all the way back, Phil. I went really old school because I think, you know, if you want, if you want the bluesy Billy, you got it in this song. You want the kind of funky down in the 
down in the bayou, Billy, you got it. You want the big, heavy blues rock, Billy, you got it there too. So I don't know. But he still well, he's he still kept that kind of like really close mic'd. You're in the room with someone playing a Les Paul through a through us for an AC30 or something. He kept that. He's got that sound no matter what was going on around him, whether it was the more kind of um, high tech 80s and a different production. It's still that kind of sound that's really in your face. You, I mean, for all the ZZ Top catalog and his solo stuff, he's managed to retain that feel, um, you know, and, and, and very I think for a lot of um, new guitarists out there or people getting into rock music, it's the simplification. It's the it's the less is more, isn't it, with Billy? Yeah, yeah. And I think, and that's that's that description is perfect for the especially the intro to Brown Sugar, right? Where it sounds like he's just sitting next to you, he's sitting on a stool. Yeah. He's got his left <laughs> paw on his little microphone. He's, yeah. just, he's just sitting there playing a little, and they call the Brown Sugar and whatever. And then when the rest of the band kicks, and then all of a sudden, all right, there's the thunderous uh, ZZ Top we know and love. But yeah, that's uh, he, such a great, great player. And I think. Um, over the years, I, I, you know, I think for me, Billy Gibbons is one of those guys that I took for granted for a lot of like my early years. And now in more recent times, what a treasure he is. And one of the unsung guitar heroes of all time, I think. And uh, yeah, such a fantastic, fantastic player with, with an amazing tone all the time. Like no matter what era it is, what album it is, you hear you hear one note and you're like, ah, yeah, yeah, Billy. yeah, yeah, yeah. You're absolutely right. It's one, it's one note, isn't it? You go, oh, that's Billy Gibbons. One Billy note. <laughs> and speaking of one note, guys, uh, number two, Carlos Santana. <laughs> Another dude. Yeah. What's your pick for him? I mean, this, this well, is a tough one. This, this is a tough one because again, very, that very good uh, segue there. Cause it is like Carlos Santana is that one note, that one sustained note that just seems to just hang in the air and you go, Oh, it's Carlos. And this was a, I'll be saying this a lot. This is another one where I thought, Oh, yes, it'll be easy. And it, I just could So I had to, this is where I picked a song, which meant a lot to me. Um, of all, when I was getting into Santana, I knew the classic albums. And obviously I love Moonflower, but it was actually, this one, um, Blues for Salvador, and it's actually Blues for Salvador, the last track that is the one I probably play the most. It's an instrumental. It's, um, I noticed that the, I'm because I play guitar as well, like you, Pete. I'm kind of drawn. I noticed that there's certain the kind of things that I like, the kind of really emotive playing, the stuff that seems to be almost like the guitarist is almost playing as if a singer uses lyrics, the guitarist is using notes. Mm -hmm to say something. And that's why um, Blues for Salvador is the track that I would go to to say, listen to this guy, everyone. This is Carlos Santana. Um, that's my choice. So we pick different songs, but we have the exact same reasoning for our picks. Yeah. Uh, I also picked an instrumental <clears throat> and I also picked a song, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, exemplifies how his guitar melodies at times take the place of a vocalist. You don't even need a singer because Carlos is doing it on the guitar. So I went with Europa from the Amigos album. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, are, I, I, you know what, Phil, I only was going to pick an instrumental for him. Uh, you know, I, I had a couple in mind and I figured it's gotta be a song where it's all about Carlos and that guitar just kind of does the vocal line on its own all throughout the song. And it's memorable and you, it sticks in your head, just like someone who would be singing a chorus and a verse and all that sort of thing. Uh, Europa's just beautiful. I mean, he's got so yeah. many beautiful instrumentals. I, I love your pick as well. Uh, you know, Santana always throughout their entire career had lots of instrumentals that they did. So many great ones. Uh, for me, Europa is just pure emotion in a guitar instrumental song. And that's why I picked it. I think I could have gone a lot, you know, I, th I thought about, you know, soul sacrifice and, but yeah. it's, again, that song is not all about him. Mm -hmm. He's a big part of it. I wanted to pick a song that it was all about Carlos Santana. So I went with Europa, but great no, choice, no bad actually. choices here. No, no great choice. Yeah. Right. The next guy is Roy Buchanan. Um, and I narrowed it down to there's three choices. They're all from the same album. Um, and I, I love it. I think he's a very underrated guy. The, the the tracks that I picked are from well, the track I picked is from the first album, um, his first solo album. 
and I'm going to go with the Messiah will come again. I was going to go with John's blues, but it's the Messiah will come again. And it reminds me a lot of Gary Moore later on, especially the track, The Prophet. It's got that same kind of heavy sustain. It's a Fender Telecaster, but it's got such a great fat, wide sound to it. And I just think he plays with just absolute feel again. But he could also, again, in the song I picked, The Messiah will come again. It's really melodic, very sustained notes. But all of a sudden, there's like a flurry of like fast runs that makes you go, whoa. Didn't it, didn't see that coming, so he, he could play all sorts of different stuff. And of course, later on in his career, he do like lots of bit of jazz fusion and stuff, you know. And he obviously left us far too soon. But yeah. great player, that's my choice from the first album. Ding ding ding! My choice is also the Messiah will come again from the first album. All right, we seem to do this once a show, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I agree with. It. I think this one, this song has it all, right? And uh, it's got the his you know the guy was an amazing technician so it's got the chops it's got the killer bends right yeah those choices of very sorrowful notes that kind of haunt you that just like hit you right here you know they just stab your very soul um and then that those like all of a sudden out of nowhere he plays these like rapid fire you know yeah it's just like where'd that come from right yeah um but i think you know one of the things that I always love about him. You know, a lot of people talk about his tone and how he didn't have the greatest tone. And I, I kind of agree oh, with that, but yeah. I tend to look past that. I mean, not many players can make a Telecaster sound this weepy and emotional. I think that's what was so great about him. Yeah. And he could, you, you were right, he could play any style. I mean, he's mostly known as a blues guy, but he could do jazz and fusion. He could do rock and do basically anything. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. A guy that I don't think his full potential was really realized because we lost him so soon after. And, and you know, it, what's really crazy is that when you think about the greats of the Telecaster, him and Danny Gatton, and Danny Gatton left us like almost the exact same way, right? And it's way too young by his own hand. It's just like, what, what's up with these Telecaster guys, right? You know, it's like uh, yeah. both guys, uh, amazing players and two of the greats. And we um, just didn't have them long enough, unfortunately. So, Yeah. All right, so Messiah will come again. We both picked. Very cool. All right, the next one uh, is uh, another great pick from you, uh, Bob Kulik. Yeah, Bob Kulik. Uh, I could have. There's so many places I could have landed here, but to me, it has to be <clears throat> this one, and it's actually by Wasp. <laughs> <laughs> and it and it's the Idol, um, the track from. See the th my my journey to Wasp was I thought I didn't take them that seriously. You know, when when they first appeared, you know, F Like a Beast and all the stuff and all the makeup and everything. And I think a lot of people probably felt the same. One of my favourite albums by The Who is Quadrophenia. And this, I think, was heavily influenced by that album with the drum sound and everything. And so I came to this thinking, well, I'll give it a listen. But I had no idea that what Blackie's vocals and the way the way and the, the song structures. But that track, The Idol, which has joined tenuously at the hip to comfortably numb by pink floyd i have to say especially when it comes to the solo <laughs> but bob bob just eases into that and the chord structure is is it's like the perfect chord structure to solo over and he just goes for it you know with the backing vocals building up and i think it's one of the best so guitar solos in existence I'm, I'm going to put my head above the parapet for that i really do think this solo on that track and if you if you kind of think wasp, I don't do wasp, do that track. I know they re-recorded it later on, but this is the version. I don't think this version could be improved upon. You know, this is it. Um, but I think this is just an emotional tour de force of guitar playing that mirrors the vocals, that mirrors the the theme, and just ticks all the boxes for me. Some people are probably wondering, it's like, well, I didn't know that Bob was a wasp. <laughs> it's like, well, here's the thing about this guy. He played with everybody. Yeah. <laughs> he was the go-to studio guy for like yeah. three decades that if you needed someone to come in and play a solo and kill it, regardless of what the genre was, he's the guy. He was the guy. Um, I have long thought that Bob Kulik was, is one of the great, I don't know how to describe what I'm trying to say. He could do any style. He could play it wild and crazy and technical. He could play it slow and emotional. He could do it all. I mean, this guy had some serious, serious chops. And unfortunately, like 
most people don't even know who he is, but he's played on so many albums that so many people love, whether credited or not credited. So picking a song for him was really hard because he's his body of work is so enormous. It's not like Bob was in, you know, yeah. one band for like 20 years. It's like, oh, you can just go there. You, you can't. You have to go like Phil did. You have to go look at under all the nooks and crannies of all the places that he appeared. And maybe he only played a solo or two on one album or one solo or he played on this album. And that's the discography of this guy. So this was really, really difficult. And ultimately, I went with a song from an album where I think his playing is the most chaotic heavy and wild I went with uh black thorns afterlife oh. uh, the title track yeah 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 so you know deep down inside phil i always thought that bob was a tremendous heavy metal guitar player and that's what he does on this album <laughs> here i mean this title track i could have picked any song on this album so of course for those who don't know this is the band it's got him and graham bonnet this is graham post uh alcatraz and if you want to hear graham doing total heavy metal screeching that's on this album as well um i mean this song just has mounds of just crushing riffs and then he's one of those guys where you talk about the the great players who can take that whammy bar and do some amazing things with it that's this guy and i think this song has those scream you know screaming pinch harmonics big metallic riffs and wild whammy bar soloing all over creation uh, just an amazing heavy song that gives you heavy metal Bob Kulik, right? That's what yeah. you have there's other facets of his playing. But for me, I always think of him as the unpredictable, wild and crazy Bob Kulik. And you get all of that in this particular song, Afterlife from uh, Black Thorn. Great. Yeah, great choice, Pete. Brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. Right. Dickie Betts, this was another tricky one for me. Uh, yeah. that, uh, I did wonder afterwards why I put him down. <laughs> Not because, because there's just so much to choose from. And yeah. and my what so what I wanted to do is try and think of why do I like Dickie Betts so much? And it's his kind of jazz influence um, that really kind of pulls me in. So at first I was thinking, oh, you know, tracks like um, True Gravity from some more recent stuff, um, and of course the the the, the epic track High Falls from. What that a song one. that is, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and then kind of bird. Um, but I thought, no, from it has this there can only be one. Um, and it's uh, in memory of Elizabeth Reed. Um, there's your instrumental. But which version have I did I land on? I actually landed on the wipe the windows and check the oil one, primarily because he's on his own on this. Whereas obviously the ones with Dwayne are fantastic from the Fillmore stuff, but I I chose this one because he's he's basically driving the Orman brothers single-handedly on guitar on here but so so in memory of elizabeth reed is my choice for diggy bets that was my first choice uh -huh. without even thinking twice i said it's got to be that song because it's <laughs> it's probably my favorite allman brothers song of all time yeah uh, i think it's his greatest composition i mean he wrote that song right that, yeah 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 that's masterful right. masterful composition um <sighs> And I, you know, I should have, I didn't even think about that version that you're talking about because I totally forgot that that was all him, right? Because that was recorded after Dwayne left. Yeah. Uh, my my gut instinct was to pick the Fillmore version, which to me, I think is the best of all time. Yep. And the reason, Phil, why I didn't pick it is because I I always tend to think that as great as Dickie is on that song and, I, and the song is his and it's amazing. I think Dwayne is the one who shines a little more on it. So that's yeah, why I yeah. love you. You picked the version yes. you did. And ultimately, I decided not to pick that song. And I went with Jessica from Brothers and Sisters. Oh, yeah, yeah, great. Because I was like, all right, I want to pick Elizabeth Reed, but I wanted something that was all him. I think you and I were on the same way, Blake, because you wanted to pick the song because it's the best song. And you wanted to pick it where it's all Dickie. And yeah. I felt the same way. So I picked another one that's one of his great compositions and is basically all Dickie spiraling and soaring throughout. Yeah, the yeah. It's got that little kind of country rock thing that I think. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Known track. For. Yeah. And does it get any better a pure Gibson Les Paul through a Marshall tone with no effects, no fuzz, no nothing? No, than just as it is. I mean, you know, you call Jessica any song, but... 
there's something about Dickie Betts's tone. I've seen him live so many times and man, you up on stage, it sounds just like the record and it's just pure Les Paul tone, that gold top. I mean, it just <clears throat> doesn't get any better than that. doesn't get any no, better. Ab- so, yeah. Absolutely brilliant player. So Jessica is my pick. Uh, one of the um, many, many great instrumentals that this guy has written and played on over the years. I think if you were to, excuse me, and early in the morning, my allergies are kicking in today. If you were to put together like a compilation album, of all of uh, either Dickie Betts and the Allman Brothers band's greatest instrumentals, that's some album right there. Yeah, you, know, you got High Falls and Jessica and Elizabeth Reed and all the other ones, man. That that's some album right there because uh, some great playing from Mister Dickie Betts. So, all right, uh, yeah. next up, quite possibly for me, was the hardest one out of all of these, Jimmy Page. Jimmy Jimmy Page, <laughs> yes, um, and uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of people watching this or go really uh or um <laughs> but to me the the my favorite guitar moment with jimmy page and it is with led zeppelin um is no quarter the live version from the film uh, because i know he's messed around with all the different remasters he's kind of dropped bits and taken bits out which kind of changes it but it's that solo in no quarter um that to me is just shows jimmy page in a very melodic um vocal style of guitar playing it still has all the kind of you know you know attack gritty runs and stuff but it also has these absolutely beautiful um motifs and stuff that he pulls in i just think it's an immaculate solo yes i was i was drawn towards since i've been loving you but i felt it was kind of very much blues based and or it could have been stairway to heaven but that i think no quarter from from the song remains the same is the track that i would that I think encompasses everything that was is brilliant about Jimmy Page. So Phil and I have only known each other a couple of months and uh, we're still getting to know each other here via Zoom. Uh, But he and I appear to be thinking along the same lines on a lot of this and is on this is two picks in a row. That was my first choice. And it was the live (laughs) version. That was my first choice. And I ultimately overthought it and I backed off from that. And I, the reason why I wanted to pick the live no quarter from the live, from the song remains the same album is for all the reasons that you just said. I mean, that guitar solo is gorgeous, right? You got the big heavy effects laden, uh, you know, with the wah wah guitar and the atmosphere. And it's like, the first song I thought of was No Quarter and the, and, and the live version. I was like, and then the more I started thinking about it, Phil, I was kind of like, ah, oh, but, you know, I could pick <laughs> this song and I could pick that song. And then, you know, what ultimately moved me away from No Quarter is that I wanted something that incorporated Jimmy's masterful acoustic guitar playing. And I ultimately went with his most recognizable song because I kept coming back to it. And I went with Stairway to Heaven. Because I think it shows off that acoustic side, that folky side to his playing. It shows off the thunder with the big riffin, and that guitar solo is like so melodic and memorable, yeah. effective. And I was like, "Stairway to Heaven" really shows you all the sides of Jimmy Page, and so that was ultimately what I went with. But I love your pick because that's the one I wanted to pick. That, that was the one. That was the one. <laughs> it's the first one that came to my mind. I'm like, "Oh, it's got to be the live no quarter," and I was like, "Oh." <laughs> So, so Phil, we almost picked three of the same ones today. Almost. If it wasn't Fantastic. for me, if it wasn't for me, I screwed that all up. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, well, uh, my next one uh, I thought would be easy, um, and it's Rick Derringer, um, a, a musician I have high regard for. Love, I've got everything I think he's ever done. So I thought that would make it really easy, but it's not because there are so many places to dip in and out of, and he's also more. He's he's very. He's got pop sensibilities. He's a songwriter. He's a vocalist. Um, so where do I land? So in the end, I went for Jump, Jump, Jump from All American um, Boy. I think that's got, it's a great song. He's played it live, so I could have picked different versions of it. But I just think this one, consider it's 1973. This album was like a template for him for where he was going to jump off and do different things in his career. And I just think the way the guitar solo was constructed, again, within the song, it's melodic. It shows his his kind of phrasing and his how his song structure. So it's jump, jump, jump from Rick Derringer. Well, after struggling with a couple of these, when I got to Rick Derringer, uh, I was like, "All right, this is another one because he's done so much varied stuff throughout his yeah, career." Yeah, yeah. Screw it. 
I have to have at least one easy one on this list. So I went also from Rock and Roll Hoochie Coo. Oh. I mean, well, I went to Rock and Roll Hoochie Coo from All American Boy. Uh, his signature song, to me, is still his most definitive. Yeah. Crisp, funky, hard rock riffing, stabbing, bluesy soloing. It's flashy, but it's melodic. It's just dripping tough tough guy attitude and grit and that's what rick derringer was all about so yeah i went i went a little uh a little bit on the easy side with this one but to me that's it's rick derringer rock and roll hoochie coo is rick derringer to me always will be that's but very you, true it your is. pick is great and you really could you could there's a bunch of songs on this album you could you could pick yeah um i mean there's you know a lot of great derringer songs but uh yeah so that that one for me i was like after struggling with so many of these i was like all right that was the first song that came to mind. Like, yeah, it's got to be Rock and Roll Chico. So, another tough one. Have a Frank Zappa. Uh, yeah. See, there'll be a lot of people going. How do you? How do you choose um, a definitive or a, you know a guitar solo by Frank Zappa that defines him as a musician or as a character? So, and there are, there are lots of times in life when you look at songs or albums, and it's your entry point that defines what you. It becomes a point that you can't escape from. Even if sometimes for some people you might go into an album that's not one of the artist's best but because it's where you arrived you always have a soft spot for it so for me i was i think 17 walking around a record shop in birmingham where i lived then and this song came on which was just a guitar solo with a very gentle backing i think it was live and it was just amazing it's like it was fast then it was soft and it was jazzed and it was heavy metal and it just and i thought what is this? So I remember going up to the counter saying, what's this you're playing? They say, oh, it's Frank Zappa. And I, it was the, my first time I'd ever heard him. I knew of the albums, Hot Rats, but I just didn't go there. I thought it'd be too hard. So it is uh, Black Napkins from Zootelers, which I just think is a, an amazing album. But that track, uh, you know, when I was, I was just listening to rock music back then, and this guitar player, but just with this bare solo that just ran for about five minutes, it, it, it was, I just find as, to this day, I think it's a great song that def- almost illustrates the greatness and, you know, and genius of Mr. Zappa. That's an inspired pick, a great song. And there's so many great live versions of it out there. And uh, yeah, he's uh, so good. I'm, I'm jealous that I didn't think of that one. <laughs> <laughs> I was struggling with a bunch of other picks. I was like, there's so much you could choose from here. Yeah, um, there are. I I ultimately went with my favorite song from my favorite Zappa album. And uh, the thing is, the, the song itself is not like a real guitar oriented piece until the guitar solo comes in, then it goes on and on and on forever. Right. And you don't yeah. want to end. I went with Inca Rhodes from One Size Fits All. Oh, yeah. Uh, I love Inca Rhodes, man. I mean, you know, it's this guy for he he used on this particular track. He uses this little effects pedal called an envelope filter, which kind of mimics what a wah wah does, right? But mm-hmm. here you basically just turn it on, and it just you don't have to sit there and constantly oscillate with it. It just it just plays. Um, this is it's classic Zappa. It's not jazz. It's not quite rock. It kind of floats somewhere in between all these little flurries of notes. He takes his pick and he taps it on the neck. Uh, It's very, very tastefully done and really well orchestrated. I mean, nobody sounds like this guy. He has one of the most unique styles of all time. And, you know, sometimes you listen to Frank Zappa's like soloing, you think, oh, it sounds like it's pretty simple, but it's really not. He's using all these different scales and things and like he utilizes effects really, really well. And I love, you know, you mentioned before, like he, he'll he he'll play like something that sounds like jazz one minute and all of a sudden it's like it's like heavy metal and hard rock and then it's blues. He incorporates all these different styles, Middle Eastern tones, all like in, in one solo. And that's kind of the solo in Inca Rhodes. Uh, I almost went with Watermelon and Easter Hay which is, you know, from the Joe's Garage, which is just tremendous. But there, there's really no wrong answer for Frank Zappa. It all depends on, like you said, where you kind of came in, what really speaks to you, because all of his guitar playing uh, is is definitive. You know, any, any one of them, any guitar solo, any song can define what Frank Zappa was all about. But uh, yeah, I ultimately want to think of Rhodes, but there's, there's a lot of great choices here. So, but a, a good, uh, I'm glad you picked Frank Zappa because I was hoping we'd get to him soon because uh, I could talk about Frank Zappa all day. Well, I, I think he's one of those players where he played <laughs> notes that in the hands of other people wouldn't sound like the right notes. Um, yes. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Some of his stuff sounds really odd and kind yeah. of perky jerky. Like you're like, oh, that's <laughs> right. But that's that's the genius of Frank Zappa. <clears throat> it's like expect the unexpected from him. And uh, there was never any. I mean, Phil, can you think of one like kind of like, a, oh, that's a conventional Frank Zappa guitar solo? No. That he, he, that, he, that, that term did not compute with frank zappa there's there's well, no because i'm sure. that absolutely right because he released a couple of albums called guitar or guitar sellers didn't they i mean you know and all shut up and play your guitar yeah, and whatnot yeah, and it's yeah. like it's just and you can listen to the thing all the way through and you'll never hear the same thing twice no right? it's like oh that, that's that standard blue scale right it's like no, no he, he doesn't he didn't do that he didn't do that at all yeah, yeah. interesting yeah. right the next well the next guy is is easier probably to get your head around but not as but just as difficult to pick a defining track and it was interesting when i i when i came up with my choice for this i was i said earlier in in today's show that i sometimes am drawn to the guitar player who makes the the guitar sound like a voice or or the the way he plays is mirroring the message that the vocalist is saying with the lyrics and that's how i've chosen this song because there are many black sabbath songs that i could have chosen but what i've chosen is actually from technical ecstasy and it is You Won't Change Me. Oh, wow. And I cho sure. chose that because obviously the song is full of angst. It, you know, it, it's got a really kind of heart, emotive, drawn vocal from Ozzy um, the, with the keyboards and everything. And I just think when Iomi comes in with the solo, it just mirrors the, the kind of pain and angst in Ozzy's voice and the lyrics. And I think Tony Iommi plays some of the fastest, but also some of the most emotional playing in that in that in that song i just and there's a couple of solos and they just it's it is like I've, I've mentioned this phrase before it's literally like water coming out of a waterfall the notes just pour out of his guitar and they just hit they just connect to all the words that ozzy's been singing and to me it's just awesome yeah you know, uh, Black Sabbath. yeah that's uh, that's you know some of his soloing that nobody ever talks about on that track yeah i you know, when you sent over the list of guitar players, I saw Ioni on there and I was ecstatic because I'm like, he's arguably my favorite guitar player of all time. And then when I sat down and started thinking about this, <laughs> I'm like, I threw the white flag up. I'm like, I have no idea what to pick for this guy. I have no idea what, you know, definitive Ioni. And I'm like, you know, he's more known for his, you know, riffs. Yeah. Uh, but I love his soloing and there's so much greatness there. And I was like, I literally, up until like yesterday, Phil, I had no idea what to pick for him. I really had no idea. Um, so I just said, screw it. Uh, I'm just going to go with a song. It's fairly early on. That kind of really shows you a lot of his whole bag of tricks in one track. And I went with, I went with War Pigs. Mm, yeah i just i, mean, I didn't it, know i didn't know where to go and i was like so war pigs have has all those like dark menacing riffs obviously it's got the vibrato i love I, that he's you know famous for again here's a guy left-handed with you know the tops of his fingers yeah. all sewn all you know sawed off and he wears these little plastic things the fact that he could get the kind of vibrato that he gets is amazing um but i think one of the reasons why i picked war pigs is that in classic Black Sabbath fashion, you know, the way he goes from one set of riffs to the next, you know, he's got these blazing pentatonic solos mixed in there, uh, but then all of a sudden they change things up and this, this whole new set of riffs comes in. And I think that War Pigs takes the listener on a journey in classic Tony Iommi fashion. Uh, to me, it's the only song that I could that made sense for me because I was like, I just kept picking other tracks left and right, left and right, left and right. And I was like, uh, do I just pick a song based on a solo? Do I just pick a song based on a riff? And I ultimately I said, well, how about a song that has lots of different riffs in it, lots of changes and some really good, good soloing as well. So, uh, so I ultimately went with war pigs, but even now I'm like overthinking and I'm like, ah, I should have went with something else, but there's yeah. no, there's no wrong answer. No, no, there isn't. Right. If I was going to pick, if I'd been picking him for his riffs, it would have been into the void. For master reality oh, yeah. i thought of that uh, i thought of that <laughs> um I, and you know I, I i kept going back to stuff on like uh heaven and hell and mob rules because some of his best oh yeah yeah 80s soloing is on that album you know yeah. lonely is the word i'm like yeah oh. that's another that's very yeah very similar feel to uh you won't change me yeah, yeah. Very excellent yeah yeah 
So I, I I didn't I didn't know where to go because I like do I just do I just concentrate on the solos do I just do riffs do I do both what's the best combination of the two maddening just absolutely maddening you know it's tough when you're when you're talking about like your favorite player um it's and you know and the Black Sabbath didn't do instrumentals really you know no like, no so they didn't hard really really hard yeah, yeah. so anyway it, but it's very interesting what you say about uh, Black Sabbath how they changed you know, those different riffs and things well and and the way they did that was probably very unique whereas the other bands would just move elegantly between one part of the song to another sabbath almost stop and then go into the next right the next part of the riff don't they they almost like this like segments where they almost <laughs> like done that bit now they move on to another riff. something else That's like i was thinking slow, yeah i was thinking dirty women as well right which kind yeah. of does that really oh, well yeah. Uh, yeah. I thought of Snowblind, which is arguably my favorite Sabbath song of all time. So there's all these these songs that like take you through these journeys, even if the song isn't 10 minutes long. It doesn't need to be. That's that that's what was so good about the band and him in general. And I think that's that's why I went down that that avenue. Right. That's like I want to pick something where he takes you on this ride and you, you always kind of he, he goes down one street then he stops and he goes down another <laughs> goes down an alley. And it's like, you know, and that's that's to me, that's what War Pigs was was always so great about War Pigs, because it's just uh, the song is just not five minutes of plotting. Same. No, no. It goes all over the place. So good. Good pick. Uh, I love him. And uh, ultimately, if you ask me next week, I'll probably give you a different song. But yeah. Anyway. <laughs> right and the last one on my list is red beach from winger or white snake or depending on where you've bumped into him um now this is a guitar player who i've always recognized as being a great musician but i haven't naturally found myself drawn towards different songs or riffs and thought oh you know that's it hasn't sprung to the top so it was actually an album called karma um which was a few years ago and there's a track on this called witness which is quite a long song and it's it's kip sings his heart out um it's one of these thing that starts off as a ballad and just builds and builds and builds and it's the kind of vehicle that again what i've said a lot, a lot of my choices where you've almost got this like comfortably numb chord sequence starts to emerge for the guitar player to go right then and reb does this in this song but he just keeps going higher and higher and the notes keep spilling out of the speakers and you just and you even if you're kind of half listening and doing other stuff, you 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 find yourself going, wow. <laughs> now this is this is one track on a half. Um and so that track witness, I think, is just everyone should hear this song if you whatever you think of Winger, but I just think Witness from this album, Karma, it's a great album anyway. Um, but that track is Reb's finest moment to my ears at the moment. A great song on arguably Winger's greatest album. I, I'm a big fan of that album. I like it quite a bit. This this was another tough one because uh, he's got some great work with Winger and some really great work with Whitesnake as well. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, I decided because he's like the main guy in Winger, I decided to go with Winger as opposed to Whitesnake, which he shares with either um, uh, Doug, uh, or, uh, Doug Aldrich and yeah, yeah. Uh, um, the other guy. <laughs> I'm drawing a complete blank on his name. Hello. Um, anyway, it'll come to me. Uh, so I, I went, I went winger and I decided, all right, let's kind of go back and, you know, check through some of the winger catalog. I ultimately went back to the first album and I went back to the last track on the first album, which is heading for a heartbreak. Oh yes. Well, yeah. Great <clears throat> feel to it, isn't it? Yeah. I, I love the, the opening riff, you know. Dun, dun, yeah. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's very cool. It's very 80s, but it's still really cool. And then when he comes in for the solo, it's it's trademark Red Beach. I mean, he's got these things that he does. He does so well. You know, the singing notes, great use of the whammy bar. And then the outro solo is even better because he's just doing these amazingly melodic lines and then that breathtaking tapping technique which he's, you know, granted, he didn't start all that, but he, no, but he does it well. He, yeah, he does it so, so well. And uh, the combination of all the, you know, whammy bar tapping, whammy bar tapping, fast little runs. And, but n it never sounds like showboating. It just, it's very, very melodic. And just like I said, it's kind of breathtaking. And you almost don't even want the solo to end. And that's like the whole final part of the, of the song. So yeah, really, great choice. But yeah, I, I could have gone in any, any direction at all. Joel Hoekstra, as I was uh, thinking about before, yeah. I'm like, Jesus, Joe, Joe would, Joel would kill me if he, if he watches this and be like, hey, you forgot my name, dude. Come on. 
but um yeah so i heading for a heartbreak from the first album i you know i would say i know a lot of people hear the the name winger and they think uh you know 80s hair metal but i always thought that winger were much much more than that and maybe didn't really fit in with that whole scene very very musical band and just a, a terrific terrific guitar player uh no matter whether he's you know recording in uh in winger or white snake or solo stuff i mean i think red is red is the real deal one of our greats doesn't get recognized enough no no absolutely <clears throat> totally agree totally agree so cool well uh another 10 guitar players down who will come next I've got some ideas. It's my turn to pick. So uh, it is I'm, I'm going to, since, since uh, Phil threw me some really tough ones this time, I'm going to have to think <laughs> of some really tough ones for him so he can put me through torture like he did me this time. So, uh, so yeah, so tune in next month in uh, late October. We'll have uh, another round of songs that define a guitar player. Phil, you want to get uh, folks caught up on what's going on over on your channel? Yeah, thank you. I've got an interview with Carl Dixon uh, from Coney Hatch coming up. Also a, a special feature on Deep Purple's Fireball album and also an interview with Yuli John Roth coming up in a few days as well. Awesome. He's such a nice guy. He's such yeah, a nice yeah. guy. Yeah, yeah be lovely fun. guy to talk to. <laughs> yeah, he really is. So cool. So go on over to uh, Now Spinning Magazine and check out all the stuff that Phil's got going on. He's done some really good interviews and some unboxings of things and a lot of cool stuff in recent weeks. So uh, don't miss any of that Thank content you. and go give him a subscribe while you're at it. So uh, and tune in here. What do we got coming up here on the channel? So uh, tomorrow is uh, movie day here on the channel. So it's the Monsters Den. We will be doing our Q&A episode on the Monsters Den. We're finally uh, getting caught up with all of our Q&A episodes. So that's tomorrow evening. And then Friday morning at the Fun House, of course, Mr. Martin Popper and I will be doing a pretty interesting show, which is proving to be quite uh, a challenge to put together, but lots of fun where we'll be, uh, we, we talked about it last week, where we'll be talking about, um, we, we picked a band, mm -hmm. and which is Led Zeppelin, and mm -hmm. we're coming up with other bands or artists who, like their Led Zeppelin 1 their Led Zeppelin 2, their Led Zeppelin 3, that sort of thing, because wow. Led Zeppelin doesn't have a huge catalog. So we're going through all of the, lots of other bands that we're familiar with and trying to see, well, which band put out an album that is sort of like Led Zeppelin 1 or Led Zeppelin's first album, or, you know, like a, I always use an example, Led Zeppelin 3 is Zeppelin's kind of folky album, right? Something way out of left field, totally different. Well, other bands did kind of way out of left field, albums like that too for their third or fourth album or whatever yeah, so very true. Very so we're true. yeah so it's a really interesting idea that martin came up with so trying to come up with uh you know albums from other bands that kind of stylistically or the way they're constructed kind of were doing the similar type thing you know like what what other bands had like a physical graffiti type of an album right yeah the more you think about it a lot of them did right maybe a sprawling double album or an album yeah very true album. yeah Right. And how many bands did an album like Coda, right, where the band was done and they put out this kind of like, you know, album that pieced together recordings, unreleased recordings and things like that. There's a lot of them. Right. So, yeah, uh, yeah more than you realize. Yeah. yeah. So that's coming up uh, on Friday. And then, of course, we've got um, this weekend is uh, ranking the albums of Electric Wizard, which I'll be doing with uh, Ryan Scout from the Hudson Valley Squares. So for all of you British Doom fans, don't miss that show. And uh, lots more else happening on the channel. So uh, please subscribe if you haven't already and click on that notification bell so you get alerted of all of our content as it posts. And uh, please do hit the like button. So thanks, everybody, for watching. Uh, for Phil Aston and I and Pete Pardo, we'll see you next month here on Songs That Define a Guitar Player. Till then, have a good weekend, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.